Yeah. Okay, today's story, I, I thought I would read this to you. Today being half of the portrait of the Rebbe's father, Rebbe Levik. So you may not have heard the story. It's from the Rebbe's diary, the Rebbe's Chana. And we're talking about Ashkoch Pratis. We're talking about weddings and longing. So I didn't realize when I just got this. It's like quite amazing. The connection to what we just learned. I will read it. She writes in her diary, I recall the following episode of my husband's life, which happened in 1935. Once at 11 o'clock at night, a woman visited us. After looking around to see, to make sure no stranger was present, she addressed my husband in hushed tones. Rabbi, I've come to you from a distant city. Its name, I won't tell you. Now, the reason for this is because if you'll be arrested for what's about to happen, you won't have the information to be able to say, you know, where, where these people came from. She continues, under torture, he just won't divulge because he doesn't know. She continues and she says to Rablevik, in about an hour at midnight, my daughter will be coming with a young man. They both hold such important positions that they're coming here, places them in true danger. In the Communist Party, in the... After my entreaties and tears, they promised me to agree to a Jewish wedding ceremony, but only if you will officiate. Under no circumstances will they do it with anyone else. Again, the reason simply is they feel safe with the Blavik, that no pressure, no torture will divulge their secret. At 12 o'clock, the two arrived, the daughter having covered her face so she would not be visible. Same reason again, I immediately led them both into my husband's office so that no one should notice them. This is at midnight. It was at this point that my husband began his preparations. First, he insisted on having a minion, without which he would not perform the wedding. He needed a minion for the Shevabrachs. Besides, Besides, sorry, besides my husband and the, the groom, he needed eight more men who would see, but not, but not be seen and trusted 100%. They would not later inform on anyone. Within a half hour, this was accomplished, except for a 10th man who as usual was missing. My husband sent for the building supervisor who was Jewish and belonged to the young generation, who was a member of the Communist Party and so on. His official duties acquired him to watch our home and observe whether we had many visitors and whether the Rav was performing religious ceremonies and for him, the Blavik is calling for the tenth. As soon as he walked in, he said, what's this, what's up? My husband said to him, you need to be the tenth man, otherwise I'm not doing the chuppah. Startled, the supervisor gave my husband an astonished look. Me, he asked incredulously. The Blivik didn't respond, but he go, went to the window, this supervisor, this young man, and closed the shutters firmly, locked the door, and took a seat. The final hachonas began. I brought a dark colored plush tablecloth that was similar to the cover of a chuppah. The four tallest men in, in the minion acted as poles to hold it up. After my husband wrote out the ksuba, the chas and the kala were called out of their darkened room. They were still fearful of being seen by others. They didn't allow candles, which is customary, to be lit, to be lit. The bride entered with her face covered, just as when she had first come and no one saw her face. She was led seven times around the chas the latter, the tall young man in a leather coat, who looked like a Russian commissar, and perhaps he was of that ilk, did everything he was told and recited the words at Ayat Makodeshis. At 1.30 a.m., the groom and bride hurried out of out. Among the wedding guests, the minion, were two men who carried Communist Party membership cards. They sat down and threw them down on the table with unusually warm feeling they declared. 
Now, Rabbi, we're hidden together with you. We feel that we don't want to leave you. And pointing to their membership cards, they said, when we are in your presence, these are worthless. And she concludes that Rebbe Sinchana, I observe such reactions to my husband's presence from many people. The incredible effect that it may yield who said it's nefesh with an emus. So even these passionate, they were passionate communists. They really believed this was the, the answer to the world's problems. But they saw, on the other hand, what it was doing for Yiddishkeit. In your presence, Rabbi, this is all worthless. Here's the emus. So here's, not only is the story of a wedding, which we're talking about, but it's a story of the longing, the mamash in the world of Chayshev. Chayshev mamash, communist Russia persecuting Yiddishkeit. But when they're touched with the Emes Rablevik is the longing to be, we want to, we really, what's the words? We feel we don't want to leave you. The longing of even in Cheshach, no matter where it is, to want to connect to higher. We're learning in the mind that this all begins, they've made it easier for us by factoring that whole model into Ishtalashulis itself. To be continued, based on, no, not tomorrow. It looks like I'll be in transit. We're taking your all night flight. So, Mr. Stalin is no shit, but look out on the WhatsApp. I'll let you know what's happening. We're, we're arriving at 6 30 in the morning tomorrow, but moving to Montreal. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Bracha Vatslach. Yeshakayan, Sirus Davis. Sirus Davis.